giving me an opportunity to present my work. In the interest of time, I will uh, present only a certain aspect of my research. But before, before I get into the specifics, I actually wanted to give a brief overview of the field of mathematics that I work in. So very broadly, I'm a complex analyst, uh, which is probably a field that is familiar to many people even outside of mathematics. So here, the underlying space is the set of complex numbers, and we have a very important complex number, which is the square root of minus 1. Now, geometrically, complex numbers can be represented as two-dimensional real vectors, and multiplying a complex number by the square root of minus 1 has the effect of rotating the corresponding vector counterclockwise by 90 degrees. Now, this uh, simple geometric slash algebraic structure allows us to do a new kind of calculus. So this brings me to the fundamental objects that we study, which are complex differentiable or holomorphic functions, which are defined on certain regions of the complex space. Now, a good way to think about these are that these are always locally representable as convergent power series in the complex variable Z. We don't allow any Z conjugate terms. So some nice, uh, so, you know, for instance, this is why these are also known as complex analytic functions. Now, some nice but informative examples to think about are polynomials in Z. These are just finite linear combinations of powers of Z. Or you can take quotients of polynomials, and these are rational functions. In this particular dimension, we also have another nice geometric property, which is that conformal or angle-preserving maps are also holomorphic maps. Now, this power series representability uh, allows us to uh, say certain things about holomorphic functions. It, it endows them with certain properties that we don't have in real calculus. Now, one of these features is the phenomenon of analytic continuation. This is a particular feature that has had impact in many fields of mathematics. And what this is, this is a technique that allows us to extend the domain of definition of a given holomorphic function. What allows this extension to be, uh, to be unique is the following property of holomorphic functions, which is that if you have two holomorphic functions defined on two overlapping regions, and these two functions coincide on a substantial portion of the overlap, then they actually patch up to give you a single function. So, uh, this, uh, so this feature, as I said, is very useful. And outside of mathematics, you may have come across complex analysis in various forms. So you may have seen contour integrals or riemann hilbert problems. And all these questions rely on these nice features of analytic functions. Now, what I work in is a multivariate version of this field. So instead of complex numbers, I look at complex vectors. And I can still define holomorphic functions. These are now functions in n complex variables. And once again, you can think of holomorphicity in terms of local power series representations, but now you're looking at power series and multivariables. So now we uh, continue to have certain features, but we also lose certain other features. So you can still think of polynomials and rational functions as good examples, but we lose conformality. We also continue to have analytic continuation, but a sort of new remarkable phenomenon arises, and this new this phenomenon has dominated some aspects of this theory. It's a very important part of this theory. And so what do I mean by simultaneous analytic continuation? This means that one can identify certain regions in the space of complex vectors where every single holomorphic function defined on that region extends beyond the domain, and it extends to a common larger domain. Now, this is something that will never happen in one complex dimension. Now, several, uh, several complex variables, which is sometimes what this multivariate complex analysis is called, they have uh, applications as well. They are more specialized, so there are some classical applications in physics. But also, more recently, it has found applications in stochastic PDEs and the theory of rough. Now, so far, I have mostly focused on regions or domains in complex spaces, but one might also want to consider other subsets of complex spaces. A very common choice is that of real submanifolds. So these can have very high core dimensions. They can have topology. And the interesting aspect to study over here is how much of the ambient complex structure do they inherit? Uh, the inheritance could be different from point to point. And that is something that we study in a field called complex real geometry or cauchy riemann geometry. So the problem that I'm going to talk about today uh, has aspects of uh, CR geometry. It's an area in several complex variables. And as is common with any problem in mathematics, when you want to solve a problem, you have to borrow techniques from many different areas. So this is a schematic to represent the kind of tools and techniques that I have needed to use in this particular field. All right, so let me now get to the actual question. So I want to start with an analytic question, which is a very classical problem in approximation theory. 
you want to understand uh, the, the you want to characterize all those compact subsets of cn which have the following properties that every complex valued continuous function on that set can be approximated uniformly by polymorphic polynomials in other words one is looking for some kind of a finite basis of a certain algebra of functions now this is a very natural question from the point of view of applications and what this condition if a set has this condition it has a certain geometric property there are many ways to define this geometric property i have chosen a specific one which is that this particular set can be seen as the common solution space of certain polynomial inequalities these inequalities may be finite in number or they may be infinite in number this particular geometric property has a name but before i motivate that name let me answer the a question that you may have naturally over here which is whether this analytic problem and this geometric problem are they equivalent no they are not so it's not a two way street uh, to go in the other direction you have to weaken the analytic condition that you are demanding so you get a weaker approximation result however there are certain conditions that you can impose to make this problem equivalent and i'm not going to go into that what i am going to talk about is uh, focus on the geometric property i want to give it a name and to motivate that name i am going to go into a very classical field that many of you will be familiar with which is that of convex sets in real vector spaces so what is a convex set sitting inside rn very simply uh, it is something is convex if given any two points in that set the line segment joining those two points is also contained within the set this is a traditional definition there are many alternate ways to describe convexity if your set is closed then here is another way to think about it it is the common solution set of certain linear inequalities once again these inequalities could be finite in number in which case you get polygons or there could be infinitely many such inequalities so this is an alternate way of thinking about convexity and in convexity you have a very nice nice construction in the absence of convexity you can talk about the convex hull of a set which is just the smallest convex set containing the given set now based on this i if i say if i go back to the left hand side and i say that the geometric property that i have defined so being cut out by certain polynomial inequalities that condition is known as polynomial uh, polynomial convexity and uh, as the classical convexity i can define the polynomial hull of a set so a set may not be polynomially convex to begin with but i can consider the smallest polynomial convex set containing it and that would be the polynomial hull of it now of course i have motivated this hull based on classical convexity but this hull does have its own interpretation from the point of view of complex analysis this hull represents the maximal set to which a certain class of holomorphic functions on k simultaneously analytically extend to so this connects up to the very first property that i mentioned of holomorphic functions so k hat p has that significance Now, I don't quite have time to go into this, but I would like to mention that there are also analogous notions of rational convexity and rational hulls, and you can also talk about holomorphic convexity and holomorphic hulls. Now, before I go a little bit more into polynomial convexities, which is something that I'm interested in, let me also uh, uh, mention something about classical convexity. The notion of convex hull is very well motivated; it's very natural. but one may be tempted to ask from this complex analysis point of view whether the convex hull the classical convex hull also enjoys an interpretation from the point of view of continuation or extension in this case we would be talking about continuation of convex functions and yes uh, analogs exist in fact or when i was looking for um, you know i was looking for certain statements of this form uh, it was interesting that i found some of these statements in journals of economics Uh, which is in a sense not surprising because classical convexity plays an important role in problems of optimization all right so um, so what do we want to do with polynomial convexity we want to be able to given a set maybe we want to be able to detect whether it's polynomially convex or not and if not we want to be able to say something about it so what do we understand about that problem in one dimension this problem is very well understood there is a complete topological understanding of which sets are poly polynomially convex these are sets which don't have a hole so if i just take a circle which clearly has a hole it's not going to be polynomially convex but if i fill up that hole it becomes polynomially convex so i have also given you the recipe of constructing the polynomial hull of a set you just fill up all its holes and that gives you the polynomial hull 
So this is a complete characterization, and one can also similarly give a complete characterization of the approximation problem that I had stated. In higher dimensions, things are a little bit more complicated. There is no complete topological characterization, but I want to mention two things that influence polynomial convexity. So let's first take the example of a circle, and I want to think of the circle as sitting inside the uh, two-dimensional complex space. And my claim is that you can place it in different ways, you can place it in ways so that the set is polynomially convex. You don't get anything new when you take the hull. Or you can place it in a way that it's not polynomially convex. And when you take the hull, you actually get a two-dimensional disk. So the way the set is sitting inside C2, it could have the same shape, but it could be sitting in different ways to have different uh, convexity properties. Now, uh, again, what can affect the uh, polynomial convexity is the ambient dimension. So I have taken the example of a two-dimensional sphere, a real two-dimensional sphere. There are many ways in which I can place it inside the three-dimensional complex space so as to make it polynomially convex. However, I can never do that inside the two-dimensional complex space. So if I take any sort of a sphere, I'm taking some sort of an embedding, it will always have a hull, and in many cases, we also understand the hull. It's going to be a three-dimensional ball. Now, uh, there are many questions. So this raises many questions, but there are also some very classical questions that are still not well understood. For example, it's still not clear whether you can have a two-dimensional sphere, a rationally convex two-dimensional sphere inside C2. And so you will also have an analogous problem on the approximation theory side. This is not really well understood. Now, what I want to do uh, towards the end of this talk is actually talk about my contributions in this field. I have been working on this in this area of, of the last three or four years with several collaborators. And there are roughly two structures, two kinds of results that people uh, work on. And so I want to give you a sample of what I've been working on. I'll try to give you a context for each result. So the first result, uh, I produce a counterexample, but what is the context? So combining several classical results, we understand that if you have a two-dimensional smooth torus sitting inside the two-dimensional complex plane, then there is always an object that we can find in its polynomial hull. This object is an attached disk. So this is some kind of a rigidity result where you will always necessarily find that object. Now this problem was not really studied in higher core dimensions. So what if I take two-dimensional tori, so torus is like a donut. I take this in three-dimensional complex space. Do I still have the same rigidity? And in a certain category, I produced an example to say, no, you don't always find these disks. In my example, I find an attached analyst. That's the only thing attached to that object, naturally. All right, something else in a similar spirit. So the context is that there is a particular embedding. So, so we are looking at a Klein bottle. A Klein bottle is a non-orientable surface, and there is a very special embedding of it inside the two-dimensional complex plane. This embedding has no complex tangencies. In general, it's very hard to find such embeddings, and Rudin had actually constructed such an embedding. One of my collaborators had computed the polynomial hull of this set and found that it was a very large hull. It was a four-dimensional hull. Now, more recently, with, uh, with that uh, author and another author, we actually computed the rational hull of this set and found that the rational hull is actually quite small. It is just uh, the extra part is just a two-dimensional analyst. So the geometry of the embedding plays a very crucial role. And of course, uh, this is part of a more general result, but this uh, particular example, I think, is a good indicator of where that result goes. So a couple of more uh, uh, results. The first one is a, a stability problem. Here, I had mentioned in the previous slide that we, by and large, understand the hulls of two-dimensional spheres in C2. So the hulls have to be three-dimensional balls, and they also have a specific structure in that they are foliated in a certain way. There, are no, there were no analogous results in higher dimensions, so people were not able to study the uh, hulls of n-dimensional spheres in Cn. And so uh, with a collaborator, I uh, initiated this study where we took a specific model sphere, n-sphere in Cn. It has a very nice, uh, simple to understand polynomial hull. That's an n plus one dimensional ball with a certain foliation. And then we showed that on the small perturbations of the initial sphere, the new perturbed spheres also had that structure. So their hulls were also uh, n plus one dimensional balls. They were also foliated, and this is a holomorphic foliation. So they were also hol uh, foliated by holomorphic disks. So this falls in the category of stability results. And in general, it's quite hard to study these n-dimensional spheres in CN. The problem is quite different from the two-dimensional case because you have to uh, you have to kind of deal with certain types of complex tangencies. 
uh, tangencies, which are quite different from the two-dimensional case. And finally, uh, I want to talk about a problem that is actually, um, so this is actually many uh, results combined. And this is an ongoing project, and I want to give you the main context. So we mentioned in the previous slide that you can never have a polynomially convex two-dimensional sphere inside C2. In fact, there is a more general uh, concept that you can never have an n-dimensional manifold sitting inside Cn and while being polynomially convex. However, it was shown that you can have a polynomially convex n-dimensional manifold in C m plus 1. So if you give yourself one more dimension, you can achieve that. But that particular embedding might have a lot of corners, cusps. It might not be a very nice and smooth embedding. So a natural question is, what is the lowest ambient dimension in which you can have smooth polynomially convex embeddings? And this ambient dimension should not depend on the topology of the surface or topology of the manifold. It should only depend on the dimension n. So before I started working in this, uh, on this topic, the best known answer was uh, the floor function of 3m over 2. This is the uh, least integer less than or equal to 3m over, the greatest integer less than or equal to 3m over 2. And this came from some other considerations. But now, if you want to go one dimension lower than this, then you have to tackle what I have been calling complex tangencies. And that's precisely what I did with the collaborator. We had to split this into many cases because uh, different things happen in different settings. And we were able to bring down the bound by one. Some recent work has indicated, so some heuristic computations have indicated that this new bound that we have obtained is actually sharp, and one can't do better than that. So in some sense, there would be a big gap between topological embeddability and smooth embeddability. And that is where I'm sort of heading with uh, in this particular area. So I think uh, I will uh, stop here. Thank you for your attention, and um, please feel free to ask questions.